What's going on, everybody? Welcome to The Gray Report. I'm your host, Spencer Gray. And if you are a multifamily investor, an aspiring investor, or already an industry insider, well, this is the most important video or podcast that you're going to watch or listen to all week. All the latest research reports, data, articles, opinions covering the multifamily industry, real estate, and the economy. We're going to break them all down to put you in the best position to understand what's happening in the multifamily industry. Matt Bosnagel's here again. We've got great reports. Yardi, uh, RealPage, CNBC, the list goes on. Let's just get into it. All right, back in the Gray Capital studio, home of the Gray Report, <laughs> Matt Bosnagel, Director of Communications and Marketing in Great Capital. How's it going? How's your week been so far? Pretty good. It's um, cold. Yeah, it's cold, but uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of a lot of heat. There's other things <laughs> metaphorically that are so hot that I can't seasonally cold, about. but the markets are hot. Although, and we probably should just mention this just briefly. It's not the focus, although we try to touch on the macroeconomic. Just the volatility in the public equities market, yes. the stock market, the cryptocurrency markets, all seeing a you know, pretty big pullback. You know, really a yeah. correction territory for the stock market. You know, cryptocurrencies. You know, some are down over fifty percent um, mm-hmm. since their highs. Um, I made a post on LinkedIn uh, last night. I'm um, yeah. really thinking about this because I've just noticed that there's been so much. It seems like shock of mm-hmm. people seeing like what's going on is everything crashing. Yeah. Um, but thinking back over the past really six to eight months, we've heard repeated analysis from experts and anyone really with an opinion saying mm-hmm. that with after hitting all time highs, again, after again, after again, yeah. it is healthy to see some kind of correction. Yeah. We're still way up from, you know, last year. For sure. But, yeah. But, you know, markets are cyclical. Things are moving around. There's a lot of volatility, some uncertainty of, you know, when things are going to happen, coronavirus, you've got, you know, Ukraine and Russia. But all of these things don't totally change the underlying fundamentals. Mm-hmm. And to me, this is very much expected and probably healthy. Yeah. Well, especially if you see it, you know, it'll go down and then like, and then the next headline you read is that it's reversed course. And all is the good. Most, yeah. We've hit so our bottom and it was all very if, healthy. If anything, it seems like there is a layer in the market that is specific, particularly vulnerable to like announcements from the Fed. Oh, yeah. Or, or you know, inflation news that comes along. But then there's like kind of a bedrock that, that is actually, you know, fundamentally good. Yeah. Um, so it's, it is really interesting. And I do think that there is a knock on effect. People mm-hmm. see this volatility and they're coming in to places like multifamily market yeah. that are a little bit more stable and less subject to that volatility. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Kind of moving away from those, the kind of the high growth tech stocks. Yeah. Um, kind of an inflationary environment. Real assets, specifically real estate, makes sense. Mm-hmm. Multifamily makes a lot of sense. Um, it seems to be very much a situation of not being able to see the forest or the trees and focusing on day to day, hour by hour, yeah. minute by minute activity. Mm-hmm. And which is you know what the algorithms and the, and the trading you know bots are they're looking at. And it's all this technical information, which is information, but you can really miss the underlying kind of picture, the, yeah. bi- the bigger picture yeah. in itself. And it's nice being able to kind of sleep at night and look at all of this hourly, daily, you know, high frequency information yeah, trading data and being like, I'm going to take a step back and not be so worried and looking at my, you know, yeah. account. Every well, night. yeah, Forest for the Trees is, is perfect analogy. It's like... You can't prioritize if you're taking so much information and you're trying to – no one can do that. I don't think any algorithm can do that, let alone prioritize which ones yeah. are the real are the real factors. And that is what's uh, really great about real, the commercial real estate market is they have those long-term horizons. Mm-hmm. And yes, there may be short-term changes, but everyone's always thinking about the next year, the next yeah. five years, and in the longer trends that are outside well, that. In the lack of – liquidity, you know, being able to be mm-hmm. traded on a public market. Not that, you know, there's REITs out there. There certainly you can, there are highly liquid real estate opportunities, but that illiquid, illiquidity, um, there are some features and benefits to that. I mean, we yeah. witnessed that um, during the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, 
in 2020 when markets were tanking. Well, real estate couldn't tank because there wasn't any price discovery. Yeah. There was no yeah. no new numbers to print, mm-hmm. and people were waiting and waiting and waiting. But if there were in the REITs, the REITs dumped. They've come back. But if every private real estate deal was traded, you know, on a mark to market basis every single day, just based on investor sentiment, not yeah. on underlying fundamentals and actual transactions, then I think you would have seen some probably some panic selling. Yeah, because people could. Yeah, it is. It is really interesting how you know, and and I'll get to this a little bit later. But how twenty twenty was this wait and see, yeah. and what what really would have happened if they you know if they could have done something else other than wait. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's very interesting. I agree. Matt, what this really comes down to is subscribe to The Gray Report, Yeah, whether it's on the podcast or on the YouTube channel, because by paying attention, kind of getting deeper analysis on a weekly basis, it really helps to filter the noise. Yeah, yeah. And that's really why we started The Gray Report, why we do this every week, mm-hmm. doing the newsletters, the recaps, grayreport.com. Um, so please... Subscribe to the Gray Capital YouTube channel so you can stay up to date. Um, we do this for ourselves, but we love doing it for all of our subscribers, viewers, and listeners as well. So enough of that. Let's get into the report. What's going on in the multifamily okay, industry? Yeah. There's a lot of macro stuff going on, um, but let's, again, let's try to filter the noise and get into what's happening. Um, Yardy Matrix Multifamily Winter Report 2022. Matt, are we having deja vu? What, what's going what, Bring, bring so, us this report. So yeah, loyal loyal uh, listeners and uh, and viewers of the Gray Report uh, will forgive me for for it seems like we're seeing the same thing again. Um, but I do promise that this is a different report. There, uh, the Yardy Rate Matrix report that we talked about a couple weeks ago was part of their monthly reports, and this is a seasonal report that is more in line with the reports that we've read from Marcus and Millichap and CoStar that take these broader scale issues in the economy, uh, capital markets, and the, and the multifamily market itself. Um, January is almost over, and this may be the last one of these that we will encounter. Unless it's really spectacular, I'm not going to um, try the patience. <laughs> yeah, of something that's different that stands out, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, aside from that, though, I do. I, there is um, plenty of of good stuff in this report, and one of the, which is this um, chart that you see about rent growth that we have here. Um, that that you can see the real flat line from around um, August through the um, end of. De- uh, the end of December, and it illustrates that this breakneck rent growth that we saw in 2021 may really be cooling off. It's still growing, but it is cooling off. And I've been thinking about this. Um, part of what I was thinking about when I was gathering these sources was the idea of momentum. And a mm-hmm. lot of times you see momentum used as like building up steam. Yeah. Momentum is more like this chart. It is the uh, it's it's what happens after the steam gets built up. It is the energy yeah. that's kind of carried forward. And I think that that 2022 is going to be a year of momentum, not necessarily rent cooling, but it will be a slower growth that was yeah. carried forward from 2021. Well, that growth. makes sense. And we've been talking about this again. It's more returning to normal, you know, yeah. in a sense. And we, I think it would be more dangerous for the long term if we saw unbelievable yeah. double digit growth two years in a row that yeah. that would be well very and, disruptive. and that's kind of the market defining question is if on the rent growth side there's mom, there's momentum and kind of a slowing scale yep. but then energy is still building up when it comes to the asset prices themselves maybe compressing cap rates or they're flooding in from you know the volatile crypto and and stock markets and then really we get these uh, the, they are the ones that are building up steam. Yeah. Um, so that's that's just something that I'm keeping my eye on. Um, and then we'll talk about that later. And but there's mention, a lot. Yeah, wages of, really start picking up too. And yeah. All the other inflationary yeah. pressures. And that and yeah, that's another thing too. Is I wonder, especially when it comes to housing affordability, and we're going to cover this in a little bit. What the hard stop is when it yeah. comes to, to rent growth because it really can't go. Yeah. On there's forever. a ceiling. You know, typically, you know, wages, but those wages keep increasing. That yeah. ceiling continues to rise as well. Matt, I'm, I'm also I'm curious, you know, if if much of how much of this because there's certainly a degree, but starting in August is a little early. How mm-hmm. much of this is seasonal? Yeah, um, because we that's almost a really good point. always see um, a leveling off. Yeah, in you know August September, people are back at school. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just people aren't moving around as much. Yeah, um, things are getting a little bit cooler. You know, eventually, and you know we see this in the occupancy rate also. 
um, that is kind of uh, you know kind of flatlining um, or at least leveling off in that August period. And again, I'm just wondering if it's more not necessarily. Again, there's they're not really reporting declines, but it's really just a slowing down. And is that just there's just less activity? Yeah, and just that makes typically, a lot of sense. you know, uh, we just not raising as many, not raising rents as much if we're not getting as many people walking through yep. the door. So that I'm just I am suspecting that that's certainly at play, but I'm just wondering how much. Yeah. Um, but you know, another thing, Matt, though, that I find this interesting and in, is how this is coalescing. I know. Between the lifestyle just, overall, renters by necessity. Yeah. Think of renters by necessity as workforce housing. Now, for, for listeners, you yeah. see the big. There's big gaps Thank between you, the the essentially the A, B, and C class, or the lifestyle renters and the and the kind of workforce housing. Yeah. Um, and there's a huge gap that if you're looking at like November of 2017, and they have just pinched. It's like someone took these line graphs and pinched them all together, yeah. and now they are almost like uniform They're yeah the, the, the lifestyle point. you know the a-class assets had you know historically this chart goes back to 2015 been slightly lower than the renters by necessity you know that e- grew even more in 2020 when i think yeah. a lot of people weren't moving in people were kind of staying put we saw that but then they just started those yeah you know, started getting leased up and now they're almost at parity averaging over 96 percent um nationally um one good thing to note though matt is you know it's really it's fun to look at all the these reports the national yeah, reports yeah. so i did Some, sometimes though <laughs> and actually really often they're only so useful it's good to mm-hmm. understand just the general sentiment on the housing market and you, you yeah. know but every market is so different oh yeah every yeah. every state every city every you know every county and then every single sub market you know we yeah. see vastly mm-hmm. Uh, different growth just within, you know, one city itself. You know, yeah. the suburbs are performing completely different. The urban core. This is really it, the, the general momentum mm-hmm. is a factor. Well, and that's and and I think that's one of the reasons why I like to read. All, and and yes, forgive me for the deja vu, but that's why the, I like to read these. Even though it's covering the same stuff, yeah. every report's going to have different insights. Every report's going to re- going to record a top market. Like yeah. the Yardi Matrix had the. Um, uh, well, forgive me. I think one of the one of the reports that came across had San Francisco as one of the top markets, and I think it may have been actually the Yardi Matrix. Uh, yeah, San Francisco is one of their predicted for top rent growth, and that was not in the top five yeah. um, for a lot of the other reports that we've seen. Now, I have collected a lot of different um, rent growth numbers. Now, the national rent growth growth number for Yardi Matrix, um, their projection for 2022 is 4.8. Um, and then I'll just run down really quick. Um, yeah. There's about six or so other ones, other reports um, that we that I also have kind of co- collated and and gathered. So Yardi Matrix has 4.8 for their 2022 projection. 4.8 rent, percent rent growth, mm-hmm. annualized rent growth for 2022. Fannie Mae has four to five percent. Freddie Mac is on the low end actually with 3.6 percent. Marcus and Millichap 5.2 percent. Bercadia 5.9 percent. CoStar, 7%, and RealPage is on the higher end at 8% rent growth. And the average of all of these, my my Nate Silver average <laughs> is a 5.57%. Why don't we have our own index, Matt? That's a good, the, very the great, good point. I mean, I haven't seen any any sources aggregating and providing an actual yeah. average. Um, so stay tuned to the great report. Um, Get a good rolling com, average, yeah. We'll have a nice rolling average. Because um, I think that's, that is important. And, you know, what I... I think is interesting it's, again. It's where these sources are coming from. Most of these are from brokerage firms um, and lenders. CoStar is obviously well. So Yardi Matrix, they're they're a property management software firm, data really data analytics firm as well. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, obviously, um, these are government sponsored entities that are you know the biggest lenders of multifamily assets. Those are one, and then the rest are um, real page, also data and property management. But Fannie and Freddie is interesting because, you know, that's obviously they're doing most multifamily loans. They're having to do their own underwriting, you know, issuing new debt for these projects. Um, And so when a a purchaser of an apartment community, you know, goes to Fannie or Freddie with their projections, I'm assuming that their underwriters and their, you know, originators are going to be going to their own projections of rent growth. Yeah, very good point. Dial in. Yeah. Um, And they're in general being... A little more conservative, 
And that is representative of really the attitude for most lenders over the past, since really since the great financial crisis, yeah. of much tighter lending standards, lending standards, mm-hmm. even for deals that like we like we know we should be able to get higher leverage oftentimes. And we we speak to a lot of different lenders really in the past year, we've been limited by how much they are willing to lend Hmm. because they are very cautious. Um, And so I think that that is um, further expressed and maybe they're lower, just slightly more conservative. Now, this is another thing that I was, that, that I was kind of like, I was thinking about it a lot as I gathered these numbers, because we did a similar exercise um, last year, and we and I kind of looked at how you know how wrong were they? You know, yeah. um, they they predicted a fairly modest, relatively modest growth, much mo- much more modest than it ended up being. Yeah. So if they were so wrong, um, uh, you know, if if they were so wrong, then why trust these new predictions? They got it wrong last year. So what makes them be so right this year? I think yeah. it's because in 2020, honestly, anyone that was following the multifamily markets, the economy, what have you, it, it was so uncertain. Uh, uncertainty was the byword, and that was you know we were we were saying it and repeating it every other week. It seems like yeah. um, there was. It's hard to believe now, and I've mentioned this a time when people were waiting and seeing in 2020. If you can remember that, and so by the end of 2020 and the start of 2021, yes, vaccines were starting to come, uh, starting to roll out, but the economy wasn't completely on the on sure yeah. footing. So there was not as much um, coherent data, I think, to make as sound of a projection. And I think honestly, it's a it's much more stable or much more predictable. Um, If you look back at 2021, there's a lot more information that we had that wasn't volatility. It was breakneck growth. Um, But we know, I think, a whole lot more, Um, more consistent trends like rising inflation. And um, and that may not be great on people's pocketbooks. But I also think that the fact that these industry experts are not just continuing the growth, they're not just plotting it and, you know, continuing the slope. They're kind of moderating things. Um, I think that's compelling enough at least to warrant consideration and think, okay, so why do they think that these yeah. trend lines are not going to continue? Um, and I don't think it's a it's a general tendency to be more modest um, because there's, you know, they want to get it right. They, and, they want to get it close. Yeah. I think that they're, they're more concerned about overshooting than undershooting, though. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that's a good point. The, I think a lot of it, just looking at, uh, we, we have a you know, CoStar account and are looking at CoStar all the time. And a lot of their for they provide a forecast a couple of years into the future, a um, couple mm-hmm. different models, and a lot of their forecast really seems to be just based on a reversion to the mean, yeah. which I think to a certain degree uh, certainly you know makes sense. Um, but you know as time goes on, you know that that mean it increases, yeah. you know higher and higher, mm-hmm. and I think they're just going going back to statistics because we don't know, so let's just revert back to math, and you know yeah. we're going to revert. We're going to revert to the mean, and that may maybe like almost the exact opposite of seeing the the forest for the tree, or you know, of being too hyper focused. Yeah. that leads to volatility on like a day trader. But for but for a long term trader, there you have to maybe fight that urge to just yeah. follow. Well, that Well, these are you know asymmetric events we're talking yeah. about. It's not a you know the same things happening, and so we can predict. I mean. Whether it's uh, these supply shortages or a new outbreak or mm-hmm. you know what whatever it might be, um, yeah, the, we we don't have the inputs yeah. to ca- well, and that's why I trust it. this year. You know, at, by the end of twenty twenty one and the, and you know the start of twenty twenty two, I trust this data a little bit more than you know it was unprecedented times. It was these unprecedented times in twenty twenty one. There's a lot more precedent now at the end of 20. It's true. At the at the end of this New year, variant it's comes. Now more, we've seen a handful. Yeah, more precedent. Yeah, I, I agree. All right, Matt. Um, great report from Yardi Matrix. Again, yeah. you can uh, two ways to get these reports. Um, one, you can spend hours every single day searching the internet. That's no fun. <laughs> Who's got time for that? Your time is worth more than that. But we've been able to put a couple different resources. The Great Report newsletter. You can subscribe graycapitalllc.com slash newsletter. Um, but also we've made the greatreport.com. I mean, it's the premier multifamily intelligence aggregator. Not only in the United States, Matt, I, I but in the it. world. It's incredible. So go ho- check it out, greatreport.com. Um, obviously, you're watching the YouTube video, and you can listen to the podcast as well. We're posting all these reports, all those places. Um, 
All right, let's move on to the apartment list yeah. uh, report, Matt. Another great report from our folks at um, Apartment List. So they do a really good job of presenting data um, in a compelling way. Yeah. And they've got a really nice, um, they always do these granular maps almost that you can get you can get some information out that you wouldn't get otherwise just by like reading a spreadsheet or something. Mm-hmm. And in this one, they um, they represent the... Uh, the rent growth from 2018 and 2019 and 2020 and 20 so you get four years and a lot of the a lot of the contextual information that we've had on the market growth has been you know you get a little snapshot of pre-pandemic and then you see what we're experiencing now and in this one you see a larger trend you not only do you see the trends that were going on before the pandemic Mm -hmm. you look at things that may have been stalled or reversed during the pandemic and then maybe even trends that emerged and uh, and as kind of a reaction and counter trend, uh, there is a very you know there's a rise and fall. Especially one of the things that I noticed was in 2018, the Louisiana markets were not doing so well, and then they started getting a whole lot better during the pandemic. Um, and 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 another story that you can look at is um, is this the kind of San Francisco area markets during the pandemic in 2020, they weren't doing so well. And now they're actually starting to warm up a lot more too. I wonder how much that is San Francisco and or in how much that is that outlying areas, but that looks like a larger area than just San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I would include Seattle in that group as well. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah, Seattle's over there. People moving down to, you know, San Jose, Sacramento, but the, whatever. but the main visual, um, the, the main visual effect of these maps is you see, you know, light. So, Blue is the cooling and and dark red is the uh, is the warming up. And in the in 2018, everything was kind of light red, maybe a little bit of blue Um, in 2019, the same 2020, a little bit more blue and a lot more light red. And 2021, it is red hot. All of the markets are hot, you know, and um, it's really hard to find a loser. You know, one of my my, one of my reactions, Matt, is um, how really it seemed like we were cooling off in 2019 yeah and if you think back yeah, to 2019 very, a lot mm-hmm. of people were saying we're really slowing down the yield curve inverted people were anticipating a recession before the yeah. pandemic and i think that you know again what would have happened if we didn't have the pandemic you know we probably would have gone into some sort of recession or so slow growth period yeah it's fascinating to think if about. you look at the you know sunbelt markets or what everyone's thinking about you look at those sunbelt markets from 20 20- 18 through 2020 they're not those red hot markets as they are now and now it's just so dramatic but it it was not always the same and um and yeah i thought that these a lot darker colors this information yeah yeah. 2021 that's awesome so yeah you can go to apartment list for that uh that's yeah and you can even highlight specific markets in that map and and uh and figure out the specific numbers for it but yeah it was a nice little resource all right matt marcus and millichap um they've got a video tell us about it We'd- yeah, I think that this video um, was very apt, and I just wanted to briefly mention it here because it is another sign of the um, of the demand, and it it's essentially kind of an, an on the on the ground pulse of the market from NMHC. What you experienced, and well, what I a was, lot of had, other people had dinner with John Chang. That, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm jealous. You know, so I, yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we're trying to get him on the Gray Report. Um, so yeah, but he is saying a lot, and and there's another longer article that I want to talk about that came from um, Real Page about the same topic. Is yeah. it seems like a lot of the conversations at NMHC were really covering the enormous demand, and and yeah, we can go in. I, I'd like to actually talk about that NMHC Let's article. Do it. And so the uh, it's a really good quote that I think um, characterizes my my feelings, and and it's almost in a, in a way reassuring um, about the competitive market that we're seeing right now. Um, So it starts with, and this is kind of his last point, he goes through five points in this article, um, but he says, you know, the market is naturally protecting itself. When when we say there's more capital available and there are more deals available, there's an implied good part of that. Some funds are going unspent and that's a good thing. Investors are going to pay high prices, but that most aren't going to spend for the sake of spending. So I think that there, yes, there may be lower yields, but they're not, but they're going about it 
in a in a sensible way and not necessarily with the uh, fervor that you, you experience in like the single family home market. Um, and we've talked about that before, like w- investors <laughs> for the most part will do some math, you know, to figure yeah. out, is this going to work? Is this going to work for my investor base? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then he said, of course, remember that yields for everything are compressing. Exactly. Now I read somewhere in, in an article when I was doing research here that not only was multifamily the most popular asset class of last year, it was more popular than industrial and retail or industrial and office combined. Oh, I believe that. Um, and and that's and that's just insane because industrial was slightly it was maybe slightly lower or in the same ballpark. Yeah, same ballpark. But but when it comes to the investors, um, man, it is not it's not even in competition. Um, and so he is saying yes, yields for everything are compressing. When people talk about cap rate compression for apartments and single family rentals, you have to put that in a broader context. Yeah. Investors are looking for yield. And they're targeting real estate as a hedge against inflation. So he said, bottom line, is there risks? Absolutely. But the risks are macro. If there's another black swan event and the economy stumbled, that's trouble for everything. Yep. And we've talked about that, too, in the context of inflation. We don't want that. And, and no one wants the economy to collapse. But outside of that, there's likely not a targeted you know, collapse of the multifamily market in specific. Yeah, w- w- which... You know, you wonder if people can wander into a sense of false complacency mm-hmm. just because everything's great. There's nothing that can, you know, turn the market over, which is yeah. exactly when it does. Yeah, very true. But going back to, you know, the fact that, you know, lending standards have been so much tighter mm-hmm. that you can have a bad business plan, but it doesn't mean anyone's going to lend on it. Very good. That's a very um, good point. Now, I even had some conversations with people at NMHC that, you know, let, you know, brokers, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, debt brokers who, you know, basically saying, you know, we could get you, you know, mm-hmm. we can massage the numbers yeah. to, uh, you know, get get the proceeds that you want. I don't think there's a ton of that going on okay. because you still, it's got to get through. Typically, you know, the agencies, not that some people aren't, um, you know, juicing up their numbers. That, that, that always goes on to an extent, mm-hmm. but the discipline now compared to, you know, previous That's years right. and yeah. decades seems to be, you know, Pretty fairly okay. conservative. Yeah. Now, and again, I don't know if this is. I don't think we're the only ones that are saying we got it. We, you know, we've got our lines in the sand. You know, they may be dynamic because the market's dynamic. Yeah. But we know what we have to hit. We want to feel confident. Mm-hmm. The, the last thing that I would think, you know, like a an operator would want to do is make projections and to overpromise and underdeliver. Yeah. Um, now I know you listen to Grant Cardone. It's all over promise, <laughs> over deliver. I don't think the majority of people will kind of follow that strategy. Yeah. Um, so I, I that and and that's you know I, I think that's a really good point about uh, about banks and lending standards and that's a nice solid backdrop. But I also you know I'm I'm trying to envision you know investors as not these this is a different sector. There probably is a different kind of emotional valence yeah. to the investment the commercial real estate investment market rather than maybe the day traders. That again we're going back to this, but we're we're trying you know we see longer term trends and more steady gradual um, gradual movements than yeah. Yeah, exactly. You can kind of step back and not be in the day, yeah. day to day. Um, all right, uh, Colliers, um, another report, a little bit different from the Yardy report, though, Matt. Um, yeah, it is, uh, it is different, it. and I think it does not fall in the same category as the Yardy report. It is more of really focusing on the popularity of of the multifamily market specifically and how competitive things are. And um, it, they're pointing a little bit to the same issues that I noted earlier, the factors behind in, increased investors' demand and the effects that increased demand is having, which I think is important to note. It's different depending on what market you're looking at. And oh, they yeah. go through different markets that they predict will be, um, you know, will be really, uh, really strong and really, um, really popular among investors. And I think they also have um, some information about the supply coming online. Yeah, let's take a look at that. um, Because we know we've been tracking supply in in just really just, you know, percent inventory, percentage of inventory underway. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, that's still it's relative to demand, because you can be building a lot more than you have, but the people are moving in, it can make sense. But let's go through just quickly some of these comments, Atlanta, Georgia, cap rate range three and a quarter three and three quarters um yeah. units under construction just under 20,000 19,000 
percent of inventory underway, four percent. Um, so that that is that's that's quite a lot, but it's not as much much as the next market, Austin, Texas. Um, and additional comments, sorry, back to Atlanta. The investors are targeting previously under appreciated locations. You know what? It is interesting to see Chicago on this list. I think that Chicago hadn't done as well as you would expect being, you know, it's it's one of the biggest cities in America. Um, and I think that, you know, I'd like to be optimistic and say that there is some real potential in Chicago going forward. And it is one of the more high cap rate markets yeah. of these, you know, of these top five. Well, yeah, and let's just, yeah, I agree. I think most of that's downtown Chicago. Okay. Is really what has been doing really well. So Austin, Texas, yeah. three and a quarter, similar cap rate range, three and a quarter to 375. Um, that is just for reference and not that cap rate really has much to do with your return, more market sentiment, but that is similar to your, what you're going to be lending, what what your mortgage, what your interest rate is going to be. So you want to look at if your debt is actually accretive, um, or not, um, Units under construction, 24,000 in, but then this is the, really the shock number to me, percent of inventory underway. So it's 9.7, basically 10%. They're increasing Man. supply by about 10%. Um, but lease trade outs are 20 to 25%. So new lease, mm-hmm. you know, if someone uh, moves out, new lease, you're going to 20 to 25% run increase. That's incredible. Although we have seen that in some suburbs in the Midwest as well. So um, but I think all of Austin's like that. They probably yeah. have some submarkets that are 40 or 50%. Yeah. Boston, Massachusetts, still low cap rates, but a little higher, 375 to four and a quarter. They've got 14,000 units under construction, about 6% uh, percent of inventory um, is underway. Um, Lisa, particular, particularly in urban class A properties, is fierce. Hmm. Um, so we mentioned Chicago, about 10,000 units are underway. Uh, that's the cap rate range, four to 5%. For such a big market, you know, that there could be an opportunity there. But what the comments say um, is the reason why it's not is the ongoing tax, pension, and crime concerns keep cap rates from compressing. There's the yeah. the tax liability. That's why I mean Illinois is right right next to us. We don't screw with it because of the tax liabilities and just the government being not yeah and that that is something that you have specifically mentioned before is you have to look at the uh the way that the government is is treating you know the operation of uh of multifamily oh yeah how business friendly how landlord friendly yeah um dallas fort worth uh cap rates three and a half to four percent thirty thousand units under construction that's about three point eight percent of their inventory um newly construction highly sought after because all these new um, people are moving in from California, um, not ready to buy a house. They might like to, but yeah. they need a place to live. They want it to be nice. Stabilization, not necessary. That's another. Care. They that, just buy, I want to buy it. Well, and that's one one of the things that um, I don't know if it was this report or, or another one. I think it was this. You you don't even have to have it stabilized anymore. Oh, um, no. Yeah, we're getting conversations at NMHC. A lot of brokers were saying, would you guys buy, buy pre-stabilized? Would you buy pre-stabilized? Like, not really for the fun. We, got, we want yeah. to see stabilized. But... If you can save a couple million dollars, yeah. even in a market that's growing, it's lease up quick, you can execute. It might not be a bad strategy, but you've got to be able to execute. It's a different strategy. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's just. Uh, oh, you, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know if you were going to if you were going to skip forward. <laughs> uh, if you want. Yeah, to keep going I was just going to I was going to skip over to um, Midwest markets because, again, they don't even give us one. I they, know. They that's just, what I was going to say. Think, Midwest is always overlooked it's it's like the redhead you yeah. know you know middle child or stepchild or whatever yeah. because it never no one likes to talk about it all the attention is on the Sun Belt mm-hmm. and the primary markets which is okay for us because that yeah. I think creates a pretty awesome opportunity um, cap rates four and a quarter to five percent I'd say that is very accurate yeah um, is it even worth looking at these numbers because they're yeah. talking about so many markets it's not even worth repeating um, this aggregate because not every Midwestern market is mm-hmm. the same by by any means, but the comment that they make I think is apt. Of suburban markets are generally outperforming their urban counterparts. That's one hundred percent correct. Now I think that I wonder, you know, 
no market is a monolith, right? It's never yeah. uniform across any market. But if it, you know, when you're talking about these smaller suburban areas in Midwestern markets, whether those are the places where that yeah. will really reward people digging into the, you know, and getting this underground information that you can only really get from yeah. kind of lived experience. Almost. Well, yeah, I think, you know, that's where that having that market knowledge yeah. um, in, in any market, in, in, in anywhere, um, there's always, you know, a good stretch where you want to be, even, you know, whether take a depressed, you know, town, there's probably an area that you yeah. know, people still want to live in and you can make a very tactical surgical investment but you have to know what you're doing because you're in the wrong block mm -hmm. you know, you've totally missed the mark um but yeah when we look at can we talk about it a lot but downtown indianapolis that which is coming back but still nothing compared to what it used to be mm -hmm. then we look at the suburbs which we're seeing you know incredible rent growth yeah. and if you look at either metric you're not getting a full picture of indianapolis well and you talk, you know, they say in that report is it certain submarkets or neighborhoods. You talk, go two streets above or two streets below oh, yeah. a specific area in Indianapolis, and it will be wildly different um, in terms of the people that want to live there or the, yeah. the price of assets. And, and that's where I think people can, um, operators and buyers can get in trouble is when you make too many assumptions about an entire market, entire yeah. state. Um, and you're just on the wrong side of town and you're applying the same metrics mm -hmm. because, you know, 125,000 per unit on, you know, the east side of Indy, um, that yeah. same type of asset could go for now today, you know, 175 on just on the other side of town. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you want to make sure that, you know, that hundred, that cheaper asset, maybe it's not as good of a location. Maybe it's a good basis play. Yeah, but maybe not. But you certainly don't want to be paying 150 for it, or thinking you can and overbidding because you yeah. think it's the apples to apples when it's really not. And that's where the market knowledge comes into play. Understanding the different um, submarkets is, I, I think, crucially important. Um, you want to get a little more macro, Matt? Just, yeah, just yeah. Little, let's now let's zoom reports. all the way. We're at the neighborhood level. <laughs> let's, exactly. Let's the talk street. about the entire. <laughs> okay, so um, Case Schiller. Price data came out uh, yesterday, I believe, about 12 hours from, from recording this. It, it's all all time highs, all time highs. Case Schiller price data, um, no surprise there. Um, so prices rose 18.8 percent year over year on the S and P CoreLogic Case Schiller National Home Price Index. Yet that was a slower rate than the October pace was, which was a 19 percent annual gain. Which, okay, you know. Yeah, couple splitting hairs there. <laughs> basis points. Um, a 10 city composite climbed 16.8 percent, down from 17.2 in the previous month. Um, again, I think that this is some seasonality. How many people who are buying a home want to close in December? Mm -hmm. Commercial properties. Everyone's trying to get deals done before the end of the year. The 20 city composite grew 18 percent, 18.3 down from 18.5 in October. Um, so uh, is, is, I don't know if this is news or not, but it's worth reporting, yeah. um, that, um, prices are up. Oh, uh, interesting. <laughs> prices, yeah, prices are, prices I are thought, up. I thought was, uh, what was also interesting, uh, you know, they do, they did break it down into different markets and they said that, uh, yeah. you know, it, these are the normal ones, right? Phoenix, Tampa, Florida, Miami, highest year over year gains, um, with increases of 32.2. 29 and 26. So around 30% for these Florida markets. Um, and then Chicago, Minneapolis, and DC have the smallest annual gains, mm -hmm. which are still nice gains, 11%. But still, yeah. those are the ones that, uh, that have yeah. been the least. And Minneapolis has just been not doing great on yeah. you know most other kind of indexes. And so just like, again, looking, this is just from the, from the Fred website. I mean, you see this. I mean, again, it's not really surprising, but just you know, want to look at it in the graph. I will also say, though, um, for every, there's an article every year, or there has been in the past decade, of saying the Case Shiller National Home Price Index is highest, higher than it's ever been. Real, I yeah. guess. I guess so. Once really, once we hit this, once we match the pre GFC level, call this one, you know, whatever 184 means. So basically, every time, every time since two, 2017. There's been articles every month saying, yeah, you know, we're at the highest case shiller that we've ever seen, and then we had a recession. Everyone <laughs> seemed to be a correction that didn't happen. You know, that's Ooh. that's what's interesting is you see the and you see these bumps in the graph where there's a little bit of a dip down of a dip down, and these are this is before the recession. Yep. 
um, before the pandemic. And that's probably that's seasonal. And and you see those seasonal bumps, but then once the pandemic hits, there is no seasonal <clears throat> bump. It is it is not going down at all. It'll yep. it's just kind of a little bit de- decelerating. Yeah. So um, that's and, very and one, interesting. One thing I, I was having some fun last night. Let's see how quickly I can do it, Matt. Um, just you know, comparing um, comparing the. Case Shiller Home Price Index with the U.S. 10-year um, Treasury rate, the constant maturity of the 10-year Treasury, because looking at the correlation between um, home price information and um, uh, and interest rates, because obviously yeah. there's a lot um, there's a lot to do. Okay, okay. So Matt, what we're looking at here is a case shiller u.s national home price index and the yield on the 10-year treasury now like as we've said the the federal reserve doesn't control the u.s 10-year treasury they don't set it but they certainly can influence it they can also influence housing prices um, by the purchasing of mortgage-backed securities adding liquidity in the system that's what they've been doing they've been buying billions of mbs's and these mortgage-backed securities every single month even though they have tapered it um, but I mean, just looking, going, you know, really, again, just going back and I'll, I'll zoom out a, a little bit, just look at this longer trend line, a little bit of an inverse correlation, I think, yeah. here, between home prices and interest rates. And but looking just at the 10 year, I think it's just an appropriate time to take a look at all this just in the last five years or so. 10 years still very low historically. Yeah. Um, and. We're still we're going back to maybe 2019 rates, you know. Yeah, it is interesting. You know, when it, now that I think about it, you look at you can look at things on a year to year, maybe like a six month basis, and there are some significant movements that are possible. There is a general, you know, a general trend, but over, you know, if you if you have a horizon of about five years, you it'll be hard for you to find a consistently rising moment of of the for the Federal Reserve rates outside of like the 80s. Well, and then I'm going to go back to your point. Let's look at these long-term trends because there's yeah. going to be volatility. I mean, coronavirus, pandemic, everything. Um, but if there's long-term trend, we did a whole video of this on mm-hmm. you know the 5,000 years of interest rate information and in, in looking at trends. Um, but yeah, there was an, this anomaly in the 70s and 80s. Um, but it has been since that period. It has been a pretty straightforward downward trajectory now if you think that you're you know so the question is you're calling are are you trying to call bottom and interest rates um we're really reversing a 5,000 year trend hard to do now on the short term rates have gone up will Mm -hmm. go up um but how much given um the desire to really to erase um as much debt as possible or not erase but to devalue the debt Mm -hmm. through inflation um and again, like we talk about almost every week, is just these larger trends of demographics and technology. Demographics yeah. uh, being a deflationary force, and uh, and then technology. Technology growth is going to continue yeah. to be a deflationary force. And when all of this um, madness from the past couple years normalizes, what are going to be the inputs that would disrupt those longer meta trends yeah and and that's where i I just i see us reverting back to this kind of slower growth um Mm -hmm. almost deflationary environment but we've got a good um you know two years of some incredible growth i think that's where it could be pretty cool opportunity yeah they're you know they're talking about like the the fed and jerome powell looking for this soft landing um and i think that uh I don't. Yeah, I don't. Outside of something major, I don't think that you can expect a really outside of a major exogenous kind of external yeah. event. You're not. You're not going to see well, any even, surprises. Even, They'll even, tell you what even, they're doing. Even that, you know. So a lot of people are talking about um, Ukraine and Russia. Mm-hmm. And, you know, or there's going to be a war in Europe. I think a lot of it is most of it's posturing. Yeah. You know, not something could happen, but I think most of it's posturing on both sides. And. Um, Outside of oil prices in Europe, tell me how that's how that's really exactly. really going to affect yeah. a renter in the United States or the multifamily housing market. Yeah. And not that things aren't correlated, um, but tell me how that you know even if that sends the economy into us into another stock market another correction, 
even a short term recession, which wouldn't be good. I mm-hmm. guess you know, that that could affect if people are losing their jobs because. But I, I think that the U.S. is going to be relatively insulated compared to yeah. the rest of the world, compared to Europe. Um, where do you think all the inflows capital is going to go? It's going out of Europe. It's going to the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, so the geopolitical stuff, I think, it is interesting to pay attention to. It's important. Um, but I, I do think there's a little bit of insulation in the real estate market yeah. um, that yeah. gets, um, I think, can kind of, when talking about the housing market, just everything can kind of get wrapped up into one thing. Mm-hmm. So, and I think there's a lot of bad of opinions out there. Yeah. Um, all right, let's Matt. Let's uh, let's talk a bigger pockets. Got it's got a blog. Um, who, who did this? Who did this blog? Oh, Dave, our friend um, Dave Meyer over the Bigger Pockets does all their data and analytics. Smart guy. He does a lot of stuff on the Bigger Pockets um, YouTube ch- YouTube channel. Um, they should. I don't I know like, why, why he doesn't come over and hang out with us. Yeah, he's invited. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, housing. How housing market affordability is affecting home buyers. We just yep. looked at this case. Schiller Index houses mm-hmm. are more expensive. They are rate interest rates are going up. Yes. Um, even if you want to buy a home, may not be an option. So, and we've and I mentioned earlier that you know the home buying market for single family homes is different, and it's it is a little bit more elevated because people um, have that kind of emotional attachment, and and it's just a little bit more liquid, I think, um, in, in terms of you, you can find a buyer and seller more easily. Um, but what this one is talking about specifically is how housing market the threshold for this housing market affordability is that, uh, and so here's the quote. First time home buyers with the median income don't have enough now to qualify for a mortgage on a median price starter home. Specifically, the median family income of renters in the 25 to 4 year, 44 year old age group is about 57,000, while the qualifying income for a starter income, the qualifying one is 62 grand. Yeah. Um so that that means that uh the housing market is uh, is entering precarious territory when it comes to affordability because rates have risen in the last few weeks. Um, the average first-time home buyer can no longer qualify for yeah. the loan required to purchase. Now, I'm not sure if the average home buyer is the same as the person that's making the median income. Uh, I'm not sure if that's specific, but the but the point I think is still a valid one. Um, a growing number of people cannot afford to become homeowners, mm-hmm. and what I'm wondering is, you know, they will come in, they will remain renters, and so they will have that consistent demand for renters, which will just build on itself. And so is this going to start, is it going to become a, a, a point where they can no longer afford rent? Rent's different from qualifying a loan, but is this the kind of hard stop to rent growth that will happen? Or, and, and we, and I've said this before. <laughs> or does that increase demand because you have more people who would have typically been buying first time home buyers, well, buying a home, but now they've got to. It will increase multifamily yep. demand. And then is there, is there going to be a part, a point where people are just where where rents can't grow not because the demand isn't there but because people can't pay well i think and again that's where we come back to you know wage, wage growth and yeah. seeing where where that's moving and um if wages continue to rise there's gonna that ceiling's going to rise but there's yeah. there's a ceiling for sure and, and in some markets it seems like we're we're hitting it but then you see wages well, are getting bumped and, up now. and that's a good point because we've talked about home prices and you know rents as part of it uh, as a factor for inflation and, and how home prices can move inflation, but ho- maybe you know these rising home prices, rising rents can also be a big factor in cost of living adjustments in the way that employers calculate how much they're going to pay their employees too. If rents are going up and the employer knows that, or or they're losing out because you know because their employees can't afford to live somewhere, yeah. then maybe they will justify that, and it will really affect these different areas of the economy that yeah. aren't just inflation. Which, which again, it it it, it can be a, a feedback loop because yeah. that's what you, you have you have you have the employee going to their employers saying look you need to pay me more money but this is what it costs me to, to mm-hmm. rent or to live and yeah. the employer says okay we'll give you a we'll give you a raise mm-hmm. and then wages go up and then apartment operators realize yeah. they look at your income statement on your application and they realize okay incomes have gone up we'll raise rents exactly and it's yeah. this, that's what the cyclical feedback loop and it's same thing with consumer you know prices and inputs mm-hmm. and passing on that that to the consumer then consumers have to have their salaries raised and then you know that it just again it's this feedback what's loop. interesting and so i this is just a, a, like a headline and a sub headline that i read but they're saying you know the the claim that was made is is location specific uh wages are they are they a thing of the past mm. or are they going down um what that may reflect is 
you know, maybe people will start moving from a higher rents to a yeah. lower rent area. And, and there, and, you know, the point is that the migration patterns during the pandemic, they have not completely reversed or, or slowed down that much. Yeah. Now they weren't a dramatic, it wasn't as dramatic as people would have thought, but still there may be people going into the suburbs or going into like Midwestern cities instead of San Francisco or Seattle. Yeah. And, um, and you may see rent growth in those smaller areas as people filter to the places where rent is easier to pay. Well, I, I think at some point it's going to become where companies will say, look, this job's remote. Yeah. You don't have to live in New York City. You don't have For to sure. live in San Francisco. That's your choice. Now, 2020, when you had to be here, we had to pay you more because mm -hmm. you did have to be here. And there's a transition year or two or whatever yeah. to kind of adjust. Um, they were, that they were saying, you know, in some cases, all right, if you're going to move, we're not going to pay you as much. But I think it's going to be – they're going to be looking at their employment pool much more on a national basis. Not that they yeah, weren't already, but point. we're not going to price it for – a San Francisco job. It's yeah. going to be just priced nationally, and then that's going to be up to you to live in a relatively efficient. That could be really um, transformative market. for yeah. sure. Yeah, and and that that you know that that's interesting because you know that could all lower the wages mm -hmm. in some markets and exactly. raise the wages in uh, more affordable mar markets. Yeah, um, which again, then do you hit some uh, equal equilibrium at some point of yeah. you know them catching up, but um. It's it'll next uh, couple of years is going to yeah. be fascinating. You and, know, and, uh, and yeah. this is and, you know, this is what we're saying. It, it pays to to look at look at across the America for these opportunities. We said this a couple of weeks ago. You know, don't just look at these popular markets. You got to look for look for opportunities everywhere in in other sub markets because you because uh, yeah. You get a higher cap rate and you get a competitive market, and then you can also get a place where migrate migration trends are in your favor. Yeah. Then that's really great. Yeah, I agree. Matt, once again, excellent Thank report. Um, if you all would like to stay up to date on the great report, not just by subscribing to this YouTube channel, um, getting the podcast and wherever you can find your podcast, but hop on over to graycapitalllc.com slash newsletter. I'm going to be able to sign up for the Gray Report newsletter. It is the absolute most useful P email that you're going to get in your inbox every week. Um, ignore the rest. Just read the Gray Report. Again, Matt, got more feedback this week. All right. I, love the, I, I love it. Every week, it's the most important email that I open. Sweet. It, and it is. It will be for you, too. <laughs> it, exa exactly. Um, if you want to take the next step, learn about you know what we do at Gray Capital besides – the great report together um you can go to our website greatcapitalllc.com we've got an investment club we're getting ready to launch a fund we're going to go out and buy you know 300 million dollars worth of multifamily assets here in the next two years or so um only open to accredited investors you know cash flowing assets a and b class properties if that's something that um, you'd like to learn more about greatcapitalllc.com you can find all the information there to get in touch with us we'd love to have a conversation with you if it's right for you um we'll see you guys back next week get ready for a lot more content we've got you know webinars coming up in the great capital side we've got more videos just loads and loads of content so s stick around make sure you're subscribed and leave a comment because again we know that you watch the whole thing if you leave a comment at this point <laughs> that's it's right the end we really appreciate you we'll see you next time